Hello, thanks for reading Mr. D and the Chamber of Secrets. We are to chapter four. This chapter is called At Flourish and Bots, or At Flourish and Blots. So yeah, a great book so far, Mr. D and the Chamber of Secrets. Let's see, let's see how it goes. Life at the borough was as different as possible from life on Privet Drive. The Dursleys liked everything neat and ordered. The Weasleys house burst with the strange and unexpected. Mr. D got a shock the first time he looked in the mirror over the kitchen mantelpiece and it shouted, Tuck in your shirt, scruffy! The ghoul in the attic howled and dropped pipes whenever he felt things were getting too quiet, and small explosions from Fred and George's bedroom were considered perfectly normal. What Mr. D found most unusual about life at Ron's, however, wasn't the talking mirror or the clanking ghoul. It was the fact that everybody there seemed to like him. Mrs. Weasley fussed over the state of his socks and tried to force him to eat fourth helpings at every meal. Mrs. Weasley liked Harry to sit next to him at the dinner table so that he could bombard him with questions about life with muggles, asking him to explain things like plugs and how the postal service worked. Fascinating, he would say as Mr. D talked to him about using a telephone. Ingenious, really, how many ways muggles have found of getting along without magic. Mr. D heard from Hogwarts one sunny morning about a week after he arrived at the borough. He and Ron went down to breakfast to find Mr. and Mrs. Weasley and Ginny already sitting at the kitchen table. The moment she saw Harry, Ginny accidentally knocked her porridge bowl to the floor with a loud clatter. Ginny seemed to be very prone to knocking things over whenever Harry entered her room. She dived under the table to retrieve the bowl and emerged with her face glowing like the setting sun. Pretending he hadn't noticed this, Harry sat down and took the toast Mr. Weasley had offered him. Letters from school, said Mr. Weasley, passing Mr. D and Ron identical envelopes of yellowish parchment addressed in green ink. Dumbledore already knows you're here, Mr. D. Doesn't miss a trick, that man. You two have got them too, he added as Fred and George ambled in, still in their pajamas. For a few minutes, there was a silence as they read all their letters. Harry's told him to catch the Hogwarts Express as usual from King's Cross Station on September 1st. There's also a list of the new books he'd need for the upcoming year. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 2, by Miranda Goshock. Break with a Banshee, by Gildery Lockhart. Gadding with Ghouls, by Gildery Lockhart. Holiday with Hags, by Gildery Lockhart. Travels with Trolls, by Gildery Lockhart. Voyages with Vampires, by Gildery Lockhart. Wanderings with Werewolves, by Gildery Lockhart. Year with the Yeti, by Gildery Lockhart. Fred, who had finished his own list, peered over at Mr. D's. You've been told to get all Lockhart's books, too, he said. The new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher must be a fan. Bet it's a witch. At this point, Fred caught his mother's eyes and quickly busied himself with the mar mar marmalade. That lot won't come cheap, said George with a quick look at his parents. Lockhart's books are really expensive. Well, we'll manage, said Mrs. Weasley, but she looked worried. I expect we'll be able to pick up a lot of Ginny's things secondhand. Oh, are you starting at Hogwarts this year? Mr. D asked Ginny. She nodded, blushing to the roots of her flaming hair, and put her elbow in the butter dish. Fortunately, no one saw this except Mr. D, because just then Ron's elder brother Percy walked in. He was already dressed, his Hogwarts prefect badge pinned to his sweater vest. Good morning, all, he said briskly. Lovely day. He sat down in the only remaining chair, but leapt up again almost immediately pulling from underneath him a molting gray feather duster. At least that's what Mr. D thought it was, until he saw that it was breathing. Errol, said Ron, taking the limp bow from Percy and extracting a letter from under its wing. Finally! He's got Hermione's answer. I wrote to her saying we were going to try and rescue you from the Dursleys. He carried Errol to a perch just inside the back door and tried to stand him on it. But Arrow flopped straight off the door, so Ron lay him on the draining board instead, muttering, Pathetic. Then he ripped open Hermione's letter and read it out loud. Dear Ron, and Mr. D, if you're there, I hope everything went all right and that Mr. D is okay and that you didn't do anything illegal to get him out, Ron, because that would get Mr. D in trouble too. I've been really worried, and if Mr. D is all right, will you please let me know at once, but perhaps it would be better if you used a different owl, because I think... Another delivery might finish your one off. I'm very busy with schoolwork, of course. How can she be, said Ron in horror. We're on vacation. And we're going to London next Wednesday to buy my new books. Why don't we meet in Diagon Alley? Let me know what's happening as soon as you can. Love from Hermione. Well, that fits in nicely. We can all go and get your things then, too. 
said Mrs. Weasley, starting to clear the table. What are you all up to today? Mr. D, Ron, Fred, and George were planning to go up the hill to a small paddock the Weasleys owned. It was surrounded by trees that blocked it from view of the village below, meaning that they could practice Quidditch there as long as they didn't fly too high. They could use real Quidditch balls, which would have been hard to explain if they escaped and flown away over to the village. Instead, they threw apples for one another to catch. They took turns riding Harry's Nimbus 2000, which was easily the best broom. Ron's old shooting star was often outstripped by passing butterflies. Five minutes later, they were marching up the hill, broomsticks over their shoulders. They asked if Percy wanted to join them, but he said he was too busy. Mr. D had seen Percy at meal, only at mealtimes so far. He stayed shut up in his room the rest of the time. Wish I knew what he was up to, said Fred, frowning. He's not himself. His exam results came in the day before you did. Twelve owls, and he hardly gloated at all. Ordinary wizarding levels, George explained, searing Mr. D's puzzled look. Bill got twelve, too. If we're not careful, we'll have another head boy in the family. I don't think I could stand the shame. Bill was the oldest Weasley brother. He and the next brother, Charlie, had already left Hogwarts. Mr. D had never met either of them, but he knew Charlie was in Romania studying dragons, and Bill was in Egypt working for the Wizards Bank, Gringotts. Don't know how Mom and Dad are going to afford all of our school stuff this year, said George after a while. Five sets of Lockhart books, and Ginny needs ropes and wand and everything. Mr. D said nothing. He felt a bit awkward. Stored in an underground vault at Gringotts in London was a small fortune that his parents had left him. Of course, it was only in the wizarding world that he had money. You couldn't use galleons, sickles, and nuts in the muggle shops. He had never mentioned his Gringotts bank account to the Dursleys. He didn't want... He didn't think their horror of anything connected to magic would stretch to a large pile of gold. Mrs. Weasley woke them all early the more of the following Wednesday. After a quick half a dozen bacon sandwiches each, they, they pulled on their coats and Mrs. Weasley took a flower pot off the kitchen mantelpiece and peered inside. We're running low, Arthur, she sighed. We'll have to buy some more today. Ah, well, guess first. After you, Mr. Downs, dear. And she offered him the flower pot. Harry stared at them, all watching him. What am I supposed to do? he stammered. He's never traveled by flu powder, said Ron suddenly. Sorry, Mr. D, I forgot. Never? said Mr. Mr. Weasley, but how did you get to Diagon Alley to buy your school things last year? I went on the underground. Really? said Mr. Weasley eagerly. Were there escapators? How exactly? Don't you mean escalated? Not now, Arthur said Mrs. Weasley. Flu powder's a lot quicker, dear, but goodness me, if you've never used it before. He'll be all right, Mum, said Fred. Mr. D, watch us first. He took a pinch of the glittering flower pot, of the glittering powder out of the flower pot, stepped up to the fire, and threw powder in the flames. With a roar, the fire turned emerald green and rose higher than Fred, who stepped right into it and shouted, Diagon Alley! and vanished. You must speak clearly, dear, Mrs. Weasley told Mr. D, as George dipped his hand into the flower pot, and be sure to get at, out at the right grate. The right what? said Mr. D nervously as the fire roared and whipped George out of sight, too. Well, there are an awful lot of wizard fires to choose from, you know, but as long as you've spoken clearly, he'll be fine, Molly, don't fuss, said Mr. Weasley, helping himself to flu powder, too. But, dear, if he got lost, how would he ever explain to his aunt and uncle? They wouldn't mind, Mr. D reassured her. Dudley would think it's a brilliant joke if I got lost up a chimney. Don't worry about that. Well, all right. You go after, Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley. Now, when you get into the fire, say where you're going, and keep your elbows tucked in, Ron advised. And your eyes shut, said Mrs. Weasley. The soot. Don't fidget, said Ron, or you, you might well fall out of the wrong fireplace. But don't panic and get out too early. Wait until you see Fred and George. Trying hard to bear all this in mind, Mr. D took a pinch of flu powder and walked to the edge of the fire. He took a deep breath, scattered the powder into the flames, and stepped forward. The fire felt like a warm breeze. He opened his mouth and immediately swallowed a lot of hot ash. D -D Diagon Alley! He coughed. It felt as though he was being sucked down a giant drain. He seemed to be spinning very fast. The roaring in his ears was deafening. He tried to keep his eyes open, but the whirl of green flames made him feel sick. Something hard knocked his elbow, and he tucked it in slightly, still spinning and spinning. Now it felt as though his cold hands were slap as though cold hands were slapping his face. 
Squinting through glasses, he saw a blurred stream of fireplaces and snatched glimpses of the rooms beyond. His bacon sandwiches were churning inside him. He closed his eyes again, wishing it would stop, and then he fell face forward onto cold stone and felt the bridge of his glasses snap. Dizzy and bruised, covered in soot, he gingerly got to his feet. Holding his broken glasses up to his eyes, he was quite alone, but where he was, he had no idea. And he could tell that this was, that he was standing in a stone fireplace of what looked like a large, dimly wit, lit wizard shop. But nothing in here was ever likely to be on a Hogwarts school list. A glass case nearby held a withered hand on a cushion, a bloodstained pack of cards, and a staring glass eye. Evil-looking masks stared down from the walls, an assortment of human bones lay upon the counter, and rusty spiked instruments hung from the ceiling. Even worse, the dark, narrow street Harry could see through the dusty shop window was definitely not Diagon Alley. The sooner he got out of here, the better. No still stinging where it had hit the hearth, Harry made his way swiftly and silently toward the door, but before he'd gotten halfway toward it, two people appeared on the other side of the glass. And one of them was the very last person Harry wanted to see wanted to meet when he was lost, covered in soot and wearing broken glasses. Draco Malfoy. Mr. D looked quickly around and spotted a large black cabinet to his left. He shot inside it and pulled the doors closed, leaving a small crack to peer through. Seconds later, a bell clanged and Malfoy stepped into the shop. The man who followed could only be Draco's father. He had the same pale face and identical cold gray eyes. Mr. Malfoy crossed the shop, looking lazily at the items on display, and rang a bell on the counter before turning to his son and saying, Touch nothing, Draco. Malfoy, who had reached for the glass eye, said, I thought you were going to buy me a present. I said I would buy you a racing broom, said his father, drumming his fingers on the counter. What's the good of that if I'm not on the house team, said Malfoy, looking sulkily and bad-tempered. -temper Mr. Downs got a Nimbus 2000 last year. Special permission from Dumbledore so he could play for Gryffindor. He's not even that good. It's just because he's famous. Famous because he has a stupid scar on his forehead. Malfoy bent down to examine a shelf full of skulls. Everyone thinks he's so smart. Wonderful Downs with his scar and his broomstick. You have told me this at least a dozen times already, said Mr. Malfoy with a quelling look at his son. And I will remind you that it is not prudent to appear less than fond of Mr. Downs, not when most of our kind regard him as a hero who made the Dark Lord disappear. Ah, Mr. Borgen. A stooping man had appeared behind the counter, smoothing his greasy black hair from his face. Mr. Malfoy, what a pleasure to see you again, said Mr. Borgen, in a voice as oily as his hair. Delighted, and young Master Malfoy, too. Charmed, how may I be of assistance? I must show you just in today, and very reasonably priced. I'm not buying today, Mr. Borgen, but selling, said Mr. Malfoy. Selling? The smile faded slightly from Mr. Borgen's face. You heard, of course, that the Ministry is conducting more raids, said Mr. Malfoy, taking a roll of parchment from his inside pocket and unraveling it for Mr. Borgen to read. I have a few uh, items at home, that might embarrass me if the ministry were to call. Mr. Borgen fixed a pair of pince-nez to, to his nose and looked down the list. The ministry wouldn't presume to trouble you, sir, surely. Mr. Malfoy's lip curled. I have not been visited yet. The name Malfoy still commands a certain respect, yet the ministry grows ever more meddlesome. There are rumors about a new Muggle Protection Act. No doubt that flea-bitten, muggle-loving fool Arthur Weasley is behind it. Harry felt a hot surge of anger. And as you see, certain of these poisons might make it appear... I understand, sir. Of course, said Mr. Borgen. Let me see. Can I have that? Interrupted Draco, pointing at the withered hand on its cushion. Ah, the hand of glory, said Mr. Borgen, abandoning Mr. Malfoy's list and scurrying over to Draco. Insert a candle, and it gives light only to the holder. Best friend of thieves and plunderers. Your son has fine taste, sir. I hope my son will amount to more than a thief or a plunderer, Borgen, said Mr. Malfoy coldly. And Mr. Borgen said quickly, no offense, sir, no offense meant. 
Though if his grades don't pick up, said Mr. Malfoy more coldly, that may indeed be all he is fit for. It's not my fault, retorted Draco. The teacher's of all favorites. My, that Hermione Granger, I would have thought you would be ashamed that a girl of no wizard family beat you in every exam, snapped Mr. Malfoy. Ha! said Harry under said Mr. D under his breath, pleased to see Draco looking both abashed and angry. It's the same all over, said Mr. Borgen in his oily voice. Wizard blood is counting for less everywhere. Not with me, said Mr. Malfoy, his long nostrils flaring. Not, sir, no, sir, nor with me, said Mr. Borgen, with a deep bow. In that case, perhaps we can return to my list, said Mr. Malfoy shortly. I am in something of a hurry, Borgen. I have important business elsewhere today. They started to haggle. Harry watched nervously as Draco drew nearer and nearer to his hiding place, examining the objects for sale. Draco paused to examine a long coil of hangman's rope and to read, smirking, the card propped on a magnificent necklace of opals. Caution. Do not touch. Cursed. Has claimed the lives of nineteen muggle owners to date. Draco turned away and saw the cabinet right in front of him. He walked forward. He stretched out his hand for the handle. Done, said Mr. Malfoy at the counter. Come, Draco. Harry wiped his forehead on his sleeve as Draco turned away. Good day to you, Mr. Borgen. I'll expect you at the manor tomorrow to pick up the goods. The moment the door had closed, Mr. Borgen dropped his oily manner. Good day yourself, Mr. Malfoy. And if the stories are true, you haven't sold me half of what's hidden in your manor. Muttering darkly, Mr. Borgen disappeared into a, bar into a back room. Harry waited for a minute in case he came back. Then, quietly as he could, slipped out the cabinet, past the glass cases, and out of the shop door. Clutching his broken glasses to his face, Harry stared around. He had emerged into a dingy alleyway that seemed to be made up entirely of sharp shops devoted to the dark arts. The one he'd just left, Borgen and Burks, looked like the largest, but opposite was a nasty window display of shrunken heads, and two doors down, a large cage was alive with gigantic black spiders. Two shabby-looking wizards were watching him from the shadow of a doorway, muttering to each other. Feeling jumpy, Harry set off, trying to hold his glasses on straight and hoping he, and hoping against hope he'd be able to find a way out of here. An old wooden street sign hanging over a shop selling poisonous candles told him he was in Nocturne Alley. This didn't help, as Harry had never heard of such a place. He supposed he hadn't spoken clearly enough through his mouthful of ashes back in the Weasley's fire. Trying to stay calm, he wondered what to do. Not lost, are you, my dear, said a voice in his ear, making him jump. An aged witch stood in front of him, holding a tray of what looked horribly like whole human fingernails. She leered at him, showing mossy teeth. Harry backed away. I'm fine, thanks, he said. I'm just... Harry, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Sorry, my haggard voice is, is, out of, is out of practice. Mr. D... What do you think you're doing down there? Mr. D's heart leapt. So did the witch with a load of fingernails cascaded down over her feet, and she cursed as a massive form of Hagrid. The Hogwarts gamekeeper came striding toward them, beetle black eyes flashing over his great bristling beard. Hagrid! Mr. D croaked in relief. I, lo I was lost. Flu powder. Hagrid seized Harry by the scruff of his neck and pulled him away from the witch, knocking the tray right out of her hands. Her shrieks followed them all the way along the twisting alleyway, alleyway out into the bright sunlight. Mr. D saw a familiar snow-white marble building in the distance, Gringotts Bank. Hagrid had steered him right into Diagon Alley. You're a mess, said Hagrid gruffly, brushing suit soot off Harry so forcefully he nearly knocked him into a barrel of dragon dung outside an apothecary. Skulking around Dr. Alley. I don't know, dodgy place, Harry. Don't want you, don't want no one to see you down there. I realized that, said Harry, ducking as Hagrid made to brush him off again. I was told you, I told you I was lost. What were you doing down there anyway? I was looking for a flesh eating slug repellent, growled Hagrid. They're running, they're ruining the skull cabbages. You're not on your own? I'm staying with the Weasleys, but we got separated, Mr. D explained. I've got to go and find them. They set off together down the street. How come you never wrote back to me, said Hagrid, as Mr. D jogged alongside him. He had to take three steps for every gigantic stride of Hagrid's enormous boots.
Harry explained all about Dobby and the Dursleys. Lousy muggles, growled Hagrid. If I'd have known. Mr. D, Mr. D, over here. Mr. D looked up and saw Hermione Granger standing at the top of a white flight of steps at Gringotts. She ran down to meet them, her bushy brown hair flying behind her. What happened to your glasses? Hello, Hagrid. Oh, oh, sorry, Hermione's voice. Oh, I do that every time. What happened to your glasses? Hello, Hagrid. Oh, it's wonderful to see you two again. Are you coming into Gringotts, Mr. D? As soon as I found the Weasleys, said Mr. D. You won't have long to wait, said Hagrid with a grin. Harry and Hermione looked around, sprinting up the crowded street where Ron, Fred, George, Percy, and Mr. Weasley. Harry, Mr. Weasley panted. We hoped you'd gone one great too far. He mopped his glistening bald patch. Molly's frantic. She's coming now. Where did you come at? Ron asked. Nocturna Nocturnally, said Hagrid grimly. Excellent, said Fred and George together. We've never been allowed in, said Ron enviously. I should ready well think not, growled Hagrid. Mrs. Weasley came now, galloping, now came galloping into view, her handbag swinging wildly in one hand, Ginny just clinging to the other. Oh, Mr. D, dear, oh, you could have been anywhere. Gasping for breath, she pulled a large clothes brush out of her bag and began sweeping the soot off Hagrid, the soot Hagrid hadn't managed to beat away. Mr. Weasley took Mr. D's glasses, gave them a tap of his wand, and returned them, good as new. Well, gotta be off, said Hagrid, who was having his hand wrung by Mrs. Weasley. Nocturne Alley, if you hadn't found him, Hagrid, say you're at Hogwarts. He strode away, head and shoulders taller than anyone else who packed in the packed streets. Guess who I saw in Borgen and Burks, Mr. D asked Ron and Hermione as they climbed the Gringotts steps. Malfoy and his father. Did Lucius Malfoy buy anything, said Mr. Weasley sharply behind them. No, he was selling. So he's worried, said Mr. Weasley with grim satisfaction. Oh, I'd love to get Lucius Malfoy for something. You be careful, Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley sharply as they were bowed into the bank by a goblin at the door. That family's trouble. Don't go biting off more than you can chew. So you don't think I'm a match for Lucius Malfoy, said Mr. Weasley indignantly. But he was distracted almost at once by the sight of Hermione's parents, who were standing nervously at the counter that ran all along the great marble hall, waiting for Hermione to introduce them. But you're muggles, said Mr. Weasley delightedly. We must have a drink. What have you got there? Oh, you're changing muggle money. Molly, look! He pointed excitedly at the ten-pound notes in Miss Granger, Mr. Granger's hand. Meet you back there. Meet you back here, Ron said to Hermione as the Wheezies and Harry were led off to their underground vaults by another Gringotts goblin. <coughs> the vaults were reached by means of small, goblin-driven carts that sped along miniature tra train tracks through the bank's underground tunnels. Harry enjoyed the breakneck journey down to the Weasley's vault, but felt dreadful, far worse than he had in Nocturne Alley when it was open. There was a very small piles of sickle of silver sickles inside, and just one gold galleon. Mr. Weasley felt right into the corners before sweeping the whole lot into her bag. Harry felt even worse when they reached his vault. He tried to block the contents from view as he hastily shoved handfuls of coins into a leather bag. Back outside on the marble steps, they were all they all separated. Percy muttered vaguely about needing a new quill. Fred and George spotted their friend from Hogwarts, Lee Jordan. Mrs. Weasley and Ginny were going to a second-hand rope shop. Mr. Weasley was insisting on taking the Grangers off to the Leaky Cauldron for a drink. We'll all meet at Flourish and Bots in an hour to buy your school box. School books, said Mrs. Weasley, setting off with Ginny. And not one step down Nocturne Alley, she shouted at the twins' retreating backs. Harry, or sorry, Mr. Downs. Ron and Hermione strolled off along the winding cobbled street, the bag of gold, silver, and bronze jangling cheerfully in Harry's pocket. The money was clamoring to be spent, so he bought three large strawberry and peanut butter ice creams, which they slurped as happily, which they slurped happily as they wandered down the alley, examining the fastening sharp windows. Ron gazed longingly at a full set of Chudley cannon robes in the windows of quality Quidditch supplies until Hermione dragged them off to buy ink and parchment next door. In Gamble and Jape's wizarding joke shops, they met Fred, George, and Lee Jordan, who were stocking up on Dr. Filibuster's fabulous wet start, no heat fireworks. And in a tiny junk shop full of broken wands, lopsided brass scales, and old cloaks covered in potion stains, they found Percy, deeply immersed in a small and deeply boring book called Prefects Who Gained Power. <laughs>
A study of Hogwarts prefects and their later careers, Ron read out loud off the back cover. That sounds fascinating. Go away, Percy snapped. Of course, he's very ambitious, Percy. He's got it all planned out. He wants to be Minister of Magic, Ron told Mr. D and Hermione in an undertone as they left Percy to it. An hour later, they headed for Flourish and Botts. They were by no means the only ones making their way to the bookshop. As they approached it, they saw, to their surprise, a large cloud jostling outside the doors, trying to get in. The reason for this was proclaimed by a large man that stretched, stretched across the upper windows. Gildery Lockhart will be signing copies of his autobiography, Magical Me, today from 12.30 to 4.30 p.m. We can actually meet him, Hermione squealed. I mean, he's written almost the whole book list. The crowd seemed to be made up mostly of witches around Mrs. Weasley's age. A harassed-looking wizard stood at the door, saying, Calmly, please, ladies, please, don't push there. Mind the books now. Mr. Day, Ron, and Hermione squeezed inside. A long line wound right up to the back of the shop, where Gildery Lockhart was signing his books. They each grabbed a copy of the Standard Book of Spells, Grade 2, and sneaked up the line to where the rest of the Weasleys were standing with Mr. and Mrs. Granger. Oh, there you are. Good, said Mrs. Weasley. She sounded breathless and kept patting her hair. We'll be able to see him in a minute. Gildery Lockhart came slowly into view, seated at a table surrounded by large pictures of his own face, all winking and flashing dazzling white teeth at the crowd. The real Lockhart was wearing robes of forget-me-not blue that exactly matched his eyes. His pointed wizard's hat was set at a jaunty angle on his wavy hair. A short, irritable-looking man was dancing around table was dancing around taking photographs with a large black camera that emitted puffs of purple smoke with every blinding flash. Out of the way there, he snarled at Ron, moving back to get a better shot. This is for the Daily Prophet. Big deal, said Ron, rubbing his foot where the photograph photographer had stepped on it. Gildery Lockhart heard him. He looked up. He saw Ron, and then he saw Mr. D. He stared. Then he leapt to his feet and positively shouted, This can't be Mr. Downs! The crowd parted, whispering excitedly. Lockhart dived forward, seized Mr. D's arm, and pulled him to the front. The crowd burst into applause. Mr. D's face burned as Lockhart shook his book for the photographer, shook his hand for the photographer who's clicking away madly, wafting thick smoke over at the Weasleys. Nice big smile, Mr. D, said Lockhart through his own gleaming teeth. Together, you and I are worth the front page. When he finally let go of Mr. D's hand, Mr. D could hardly feel his fingers. He tried to sidle back over to the Weasleys, but Lockhart threw an arm around his shoulders and clamped him tightly to his side. Ladies and gentlemen, he said loudly, waving for quiet, what an extraordinary moment this is. The perfect moment for me to make this little announcement I've been sitting on for some time. When young Harry here stepped into Flourish and Bots today, he only wanted to buy my autobiography, which I shall be happy to present to him now free of charge. The crowd applauded again. He had no idea, Lockhart continued, giving Harry a little shake that made his glasses slip to the end of his nose, that he would shortly be getting much, much more than my book, Magical Me. He and his schoolmates will, in fact, be getting the real Magical Me. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have the great pleasure and pride in announcing that this September I will be taking up the post of defense against the dark arts teacher at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The crowd cheered and clapped, and Harry found himself being presented with the entire works of Gildery Lockhart. Staggering slightly under their weight, he managed to make his way out of the limelight to the edge of the room, where Ginny was standing next to her new cauldron. You have these, Harry mumbled to her, tipping her books into her called the cauldron. I'll buy my own. Bet you loved that, didn't you, Potter? said a voice Harry had no trouble recognizing. He straightened up and found himself face to face with Draco Malfoy, who was wearing his usual sneer. Famous Harry Potter, said Malfoy. Can't even go into a bookstore without making the front page. Leave him alone. He didn't want all that, said Ginny. It was the first time she had spoken in front of Mr. D. She was glaring at Malfoy. Mr. D, you've got yourself a girlfriend, drawled Malfoy. Ginny went scarlet, as, went scarlet as Ron and Hermione fought their way over, both clutching stacks of Lockhart's books. Oh, it's you, said Ron, looking at Malfoy as if he were something unpleasant on the sole of his shoe. Bet you're surprised to see Mr. D here, eh? Not as surprised as I am to see you in a shop, Weasley, retorted Malfoy. I suppose you and your parents will go hungry for a month to pay for all those.
Ron went as red as Ginny. He dropped his books into the cauldron, too, and started toward Malfoy. But Mr. D and Hermione grabbed the back of his jacket. Ron, said Mr. Weasley, struggling over with Fred and George. What are you doing? It's too crowded in here. Let's go outside. Well, 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 Arthur Weasley. It was Mr. Malfoy. He stood with his hand on Draco's shoulder, sneering in just the same way. Lucius, said Mr. Weasley, nodding coldly. Busy time at the ministry, I hear, said Mr. Malfoy. All those raids. I hope they're paying you overtime. He reached into Ginny's cauldron and extracted from amid the glossy Lockhart books a very old, battered copy of A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration. Obviously not, Mr. Malfoy said. Dear me, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of a wi to the name of wizard if they can't even pay you well for it? Mr. Weasley flushed darker than either Ron or Ginny. We have a very different idea of what disgraces the name of wizard, Malfoy, he said. Clearly, said Mr. Malfoy, his pale eyes straying to Mr. and Mrs. Granger, who were watching apprehensively. The company you keep, Weasley, I thought you and your family could sink no lower. There was a thud of metal as Ginny's cauldron went flying. Mr. Weasley had thrown himself at Mr. Malfoy, knocking him backward into a bookshelf. Dozens of heavy spellbooks came thundering down over their heads, and there was a yell of, Get him, Dad! from Fred or George. Mrs. Weasley was shrinking. No, Arthur, no! The crowd stampeded backward, knocking more shelves over. Gentlemen, please, cried the assistant. And then louder than all, Break it up there, gents, break it up. Oh. Break it up there, gents, break it up. Break it up. I, my Hagrid voice is not working today. Break it up, gents. Break it up. Hagrid was wading toward them through a sea of books. In an instant, he pulled Mr. Weasley and Mr. Malfoy apart. Mr. Weasley had a cut lip, and Mr. Malfoy had been hit in the eye by and the Encyclopedia of Toadstools. He was still holding Ginny's old Transfiguration book. He thrust it at her, his eyes glittering with malice. Here, girl, take your book. It's the best your father can give you. Pulling himself out of Hagrid's grip, he beckoned to Draco and swept from the shop. You should have ignored him, Arthur. Oh, there it came back. You should have ignored him, Arthur, said Hagrid, almost lifting Mr. Weasley off his feet as he straightened his orbs. Rotten to the core, the whole family, everyone knows that. No Malfoy's worth listening to her. Bad blood, that's what it is. Come on now, let's get out of here. The assistant looked as though he wanted to stop them leaving, but he barely came up to Hagrid's waist and seemed to be thinking better of it. They hurried up the street, Granger shaking with fright, and Mrs. Weasley beside herself with fury. A fine example to set for your children, brawling in public, what Gildery Lockhart would have said. He was pleased, said Fred. Didn't you hear him as we were leaving? He was asking if that bloke from the Daily Prophet, if he'd been able to work the fight into his report, said it was all publicity. But it was a subdued group that headed back to the fireside in the Leaky Cauldron, where Harry, the Weasleys, and all their shopping would be traveling back to the borough using flu powder. They said goodbye to the Grangers, who were leaving the pub for the Muggle Street on the other side. Mr. Weasley started to ask them how buses worked, how bus stops worked, but stopped quickly at the look on Mrs. Weasley's face. Harry took off his glasses and put them safely in his pocket before helping himself to flu powder. It definitely wasn't his favorite way to travel. Woo! That was a long chapter, 33 minutes! My voice is tired. I think I shall take a rest. Thank you for listening to Chapter 4 of Mr. D and the Chamber of Secrets. Goodbye.